Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Philippians in chapter number three. And that certainly is our prayer every time we come together is that the Word of God would speak. And that's what we're doing this morning. We're asking God to speak to us through His Word. And today we find ourselves in Philippians in chapter number three. I heard a pastor recently say, open your Bibles, and everybody looked at him, and he said, it doesn't matter where it opens, it's all good, but today we're going to be in Philippians chapter number three, and we're going to read it in verses number one, and we're going to stop in verse number 10 together this morning, reiterating where we started last week. Philippians chapter number three, the word of God says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, will I more? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Praise God for the reading of his word together this morning. Father, we ask you today that you'll take the written word and the written Word of God would connect with the living Word of God within us. And Father, you'll write something on our hearts today. You'll do a work through the precious Word of God in our lives. It's been sung today, Word of God, speak. And so Father, we ask that the written Word and the living Word, Jesus, would speak to us today. We've not come this morning for just a religious moment but Father, we've truly come to hear from heaven. And so we ask this morning that you would fill each one of us with your precious Holy Spirit. And Father, as we're filled with your Spirit, we'll preach and hear what you have to say to us. So Father, please work today through the Word, and we'll give you the glory and the honor and praise for what you'll accomplish. For it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray these things. Amen. The book of Philippians is a book about the joy of the Lord. This is our 11th message in the book of Philippians because we have been looking verse by verse and line item by line at him through this book. And we know that the theme of this book is really discovering joy in Jesus Christ. We know this, that circumstances of life, that is not joy. Circumstances are dependent upon happiness and happiness is dependent upon circumstances and there are many circumstances in life that do not bring us happiness. In fact, you may be here this morning and going through a trial or going through a difficult moment and you might say this morning, Pastor, I'm here today but I'm not really happy. That's okay. You can still go through trials and not be happy but have joy, amen? Because joy is not dependent upon happenings and circumstances. Joy is dependent upon my walk with Jesus Christ. And in the middle of trials, the Apostle Paul, in the middle of a prison experience of life, sitting in a prison that he's never going to walk out of, sitting in a prison, writes three epistles under inspiration of God's Spirit. The book of 1 Timothy, then the book of Philippians, 
And we believe the final book, the book of 2 Timothy, sandwiched in between these pastoral epistles to Timothy is this epistle or letter of joy, unbridled, unrivaled joy that Paul tells us each Christian can have and watch, should have, because that joy is discovered in Jesus Christ. Now we've learned this, if we're going to have joy, we've got to get our minds right. Our minds have got to get right. We learned in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27 that if we're going to have joy, we have to have a single mind. Our mind has to be fixed upon the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. Then we learned in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 5 that if we're going to have joy, we have to have a servant's mind. People who exalt themselves do not have joy. They may have temporary happiness, but they do not have joy. But people who are willing to serve others and humble themselves as Jesus Christ humbled himself, they can have real joy. And that joy is only found in him. So we've learned in chapter 2 that we must have a servant's mind. Then in chapter number 3, we've learned last week that we have to have a spiritual mind. A spiritual mind. A spiritual mind is a mind that is not fixed on temporary things, but it is a mind that is focused on eternal things. Maybe we could say it like this. A spiritual mind is not a mind that is focused on how someone else may see us, but a spiritual mind is much more focused on how God sees us. And here in Philippians chapter number 3, Really, the first beginning 10, 12 verses really is one sentence that goes all together. Paul talks to this church about how to have a spiritual mindset, how to keep our minds focused on eternal things that really will matter one day. Does anybody else struggle to keep your mind on things that really matter? Anybody else ever driving before and while you're driving, you're thinking about everything else in the world except for Driving, anybody else ever do that? Yes, you live in Atlanta, Georgia. I know you do that. We all do that. Sometimes we're busy, we're focused, we're thinking about everything except for what's really important. Well, Paul says to this church of Philippians, in Philippi, he says to them, if you're going to have joy, you must get your mind focused on that which really matters. Because how many of you know this? Temporary things can rob your joy very quickly. If you're focused on them, they can take your joy. But if you're focused on eternal things, you can have joy even in the midst of the worst of circumstances. So Paul's teaching us how to get our minds right in Philippians chapter 3. He starts Philippians chapter 3 by giving a strong warning. Last week, we looked at this first thought. In the first three verses, Paul gives a caution about religious righteousness. Righteousness defined is simply this, being made right and declared as right before God. Being made right and being declared as right before God. Now, Paul starts in these first three verses and he warns that there are those that are trying to be made right and declared to be right before God by being religious. He warns against them in verse number one and two and three. In fact, look what he said in verse number two. He said, beware of dogs. We looked at that last week. He said, beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Maybe we could say it this way, that these first three verses focus us on a warning that Paul gives about those who are trying to justify themselves and be made right before God by doing religious deeds, external things. Paul in this day warned about the Judaizers. The Judaizers were those who had externalized religion. They had said in order to be right with God, you must do this, you must do this, you must not do this. And they had a long list of checklists of rules and external regulations. And watch, there's nothing wrong with rules and regulations. That's part of life. 
But if you're depending on your rules and regulations to make you right before God, you're not going to ever make it. It'll never work. That's what we call a religious righteousness. Paul took the first three verses and he says that he warned against a religious righteousness. I have here today a 35 foot tape measure. And this morning I'm going to let this tape measure illustrate the righteousness of God. I'm going to, Ryan, do you mind grabbing the other end of this for just a second? I'm going to need some help preaching this morning. That's perfect. Come on, man. There we go. And uh, this 35 foot tape measure is going to illustrate for us the righteousness of God. The Bible tells us that in order for someone, you can go that way if you don't mind pulling it out. That'd be perfect. Keep it coming. I think that's good right there. Thank you, Ryan. We'll just set it right there. Appreciate your help this morning. This tape measure is going to illustrate for us this morning the righteousness of God. On this side over here, we're going to say that this is mankind in his or her sinfulness. In our natural state, we are not righteous. In our natural state, we'll let the other end of the tape measure, the right side of the room is very righteous this morning. I'm sorry for this side, but we'll reverse it in a minute. Anyway, so over here, this is going to represent, that 35 feet is going to represent God's perfection, God's holiness, God's righteousness. No sin, no blemish, God is light, John says in 1 John chapter 1, and in him is no darkness at all. My friend, God has never done one thing wrong. He is perfect, he is righteous, it is his attribute. God is righteous. But here this morning, Paul describes for us in the first three verses, those who attempt to be made right with God by doing religious deeds. This morning, we're going to meet Mr. Religion. I think Mr. Religion is coming out here this morning. I think he's coming out as he comes out. Mr. Religion, come on out this morning. We appreciate you being here with us today. Let's give Mr. Religion a hand. He's a pretty good guy. <laughs> come on over here, Mr. Religion. You're not over there. So here we have Superman, Mr. Religion. Mr. Religion is doing everything he can within himself to get himself to be seen by God as okay, as right. Watch, Mr. Religion, we might say it this way. He's born in the South. He's a George Bulldog fan, praise the Lord. <laughs> he is, uh, takes good care of his family. He tries to obey the golden rule. He goes to church at least on Christmas and Easter, praise God. He's uh, got a good moral compass, a good framework, and so Mr. Religion is going to step here at the very end. And Mr. Religion, we're going to give you three steps. You get three steps. These three steps are going to represent his life. And Mr. Religion is going to get three steps to try to make it all the way to God. Have you already taken them? He took them. Man, he didn't make it very far. <laughs> Mr. Religion, watch. He falls into a category that all mankind falls into. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, watch, for all have sinned, and watch, have come short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is He's perfect, He's holy, He is righteous. But wait a minute, Mr. Religion, although, watch, he goes to church, Mr. Religion may have even been baptized. Mr. Religion may have even read his Bible through already this year. Mr. Religion may be involved in all kinds of good religious deeds, but watch carefully. It did not make him right or righteous before God. Mr. Religion, you can hang out there for just a second. We're going to meet a second characteristic in Philippians chapter 1. Paul talked in the first three verses about that religious righteousness, and he warned against it. He gave a caution against religious righteousness. But there's a second thing that Paul did. Paul gives a second statement. He gives now a checklist of ritual righteousness. A checklist of ritual righteousness. 
Now he warned, he gave a caution against this religious righteousness, and he said it's not enough. But then he goes and he gives his own personal testimony about what he did in the name of religion and in the name of God. He took his religion to a whole new level. He didn't just say, I believe this. Paul is a man that acted upon what he said he believed. He didn't just say, hey, I'm just a religious guy. I'm a good guy. I'm a good person. No, 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 no. He said, let me tell you who I was. I took my religion and I put shoe leather to it. I did something with my religion. By the way, I have a lot of respect for people that at least try to do something with their religion. They don't say, I'm just religious, but they at least try to put it to work, and that's what Paul did. Paul tried his best to say, I believe these things, and here's what I did about them. Well, what did he do? Real quickly, I want you to see. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number 3 and verses number 4 through 6, Paul had seven <coughs> ritualistic things that he was involved in that he was hoping would make him right with God. This just wasn't external. This became internal and external. Notice what he said. He said he was circumcised the eighth day. This was very important to a Jewish person. This was the covenant that God had made with Abraham to set his people apart. And Paul said, I was involved. I was circumcised the eighth day. I was involved in this ritual act in order to demonstrate that I was a covenant child of God of Israel. He was circumcised the eighth day. He said, I was of the stock of Israel. He was a descendant of Abraham, but more importantly, of Jacob. Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of who the nation of Israel descended from. And he said, I was of that stock. In other words, Paul said, I wasn't just a Jewish person by uh, religious deeds. I was a pure-blooded religious Jewish person. I was of the stock of Israel. Then he said this, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Why was that important? Well, if you remember your Bible, the first king of Israel was from the tribe of Benjamin. His name was Saul. Many people believe that Paul, before he was saved, his name was what, church? His name was Saul. Many people believe that he was named after this first king of Israel, this king Saul. In other words, he's saying, I wasn't just a, uh, I wasn't just a Jewish person, but I was circumcised the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel. I was a pure blood, and I was from the best of the best of the tribes of Israel. He's holding up his nationality and saying, this will make me righteous. Watch. It's like someone saying, I'm an American. Of course I'm a Christian. Pastor, nobody believes that. You need to get out more. Many people believe I'm a Christian because of my background. I was born a Southern Baptist. I'm a Christian. Really? Hold on. This is exactly what Paul said I was counting on for my righteousness. Wait a minute. He said I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. How many of you heard this statement before? Remember what Daniel said about the kings of the earth? He said the king of kings or Lord of lords referred to again in the book of Revelation, king of kings and Lord of lords. In other words, I wasn't just a Hebrew, but I was the best of the best of the Hebrews. Paul had not succumbed to the liberal sect of the Hebrews. There was a Hebrew sect that had, uh, that had succumbed to the Hellenistic view and had cheapened their religion and made it very convenient. And Paul said, no, I didn't go the convenient route. I was of the strictest route possible of the Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was educated at the feet of Gamal, the most respected Jewish teacher of the day. So Paul was pure-blooded. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And then what he said... He said, I was a Pharisee. Now, we read Pharisee, we say, oh, that's a bad thing, a Pharisee. They, they elevated tradition over the Word of God, and that's true. But I want you to know something, that a Pharisee in this day was someone who was very well respected in the religious world. It's turned into a bad thing now, but in this day, a Pharisee was someone who knew the first five books of the Bible by heart. That's 24% of your Bible. They knew it by heart. They had memorized it. They had learned every code, every law of God, and were attempting to be right with God through these ritualistic things. And Paul said this, I was a Pharisee. 
regarding zeal. How zealous was Paul? Well, he said this, I was persecuting the church. You see, the early New Testament church was viewed as heretics. They were viewed as those who were attempting to cheapen the Word of God and take away from the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition. They were teaching, the New Early Church was teaching that Jesus really was the risen Son of God and the Messiah. And the Hellenistic Jews and even the, the Jews that were the Pharisees and the Hebrews were holding on to their religion and saying, no, 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 he's not the Messiah. He's not really who he said he was. And Paul was a part of the group that started persecuting and watch, killing early Christians. How zealous was he for his righteousness? He said, I went on crusades. In fact, he went to a place called Damascus, and on the road to Damascus, the Bible said he was on his way to waste the church of God. That's how zealous he was. We might call him an extremist today. We might call him a radical today. That's how devout he was to this Jewish faith. And listen, the reason he was devout was because he was attempting to be right before God by his own ritual deeds. Zealous. How about this? Touching the righteousness of the law? Blameless. What does that mean? Doesn't mean that he was perfect. Doesn't mean that he kept the law of God perfectly. But what it does mean that is that he kept every Jewish law and custom and observed it the best he could, he was above reproach. If you looked at Paul's life, you would say one thing about him. Man, he is Jewish through and through. There is no doubt about him. If you looked at Paul's checklist of ritual righteousness, I would venture to say no one in here could hold a candle up to his religious fervor. I think we have Mr. Ritual here this morning. Let's meet Mr. Ritual. Why don't you give Mr. Ritual a hand here for just a second. <coughs> We've met Mr. Religion. Mr. Ritual, come on over here if you would. Stay right there, Mr. Religion. And Mr. Religion tried to get to God by observing religious things. He took three steps, and how many of you know he just didn't make it very far? He still has a long way to go in order to be made right with God. He tried his best, but he couldn't, in his own, get very far. And Paul warned. He gave a caution about religious righteousness, but now he gives a checklist of his own ritual righteousness. He says, I tried not just religion, but I tried the rituals too. Tell you what, Brother Matt, I'm going to give you seven big steps, and I want you to get 35 feet. Now, if you do it, I'm going to be upset. Anyway, go ahead. Seven steps. One. Two, three, step it out there. Four, five, six. Come on, Paul. Seven. Whoa. Oh, man. The standard is 35 feet. The religious guy said, I believe. I go to church. I'm a pretty good guy. But he has a long way to go. He made it six feet. Mr. Ritual said, I believe all these things, but I'm going to put them to work. I'm going to get busy. I'm going to persecute the church of God, Paul said. I'm going to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And look how far he came in his own righteousness. 27 feet. We might all go, whoa. That's pretty awesome. One small problem. I remind you what Romans 3, 23 says. For all have sinned, and watch, come short of the glory of God. Even though he made it further than Mr. Religious, many people would even make it past one foot because they would say, man, I'm the worst sinner there is. I wouldn't even make it on this scale. But here's the question I have for you. It doesn't matter how bad someone is, how religious someone is, or how uh, ritualistic someone is. Here's the problem. They have still missed the mark. You see, society might say, this is a pretty good guy over here. Man, he's a good fella. He goes to church. He's going to get his kids at 
Can't moose on the loose tomorrow. He's a good old boy. Here's the problem. Society is not the standard. I might even as a pastor say, ho, 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 ho. Woo! Look at this boy. I like him. Man, every time the doors are open, he's there. He sings in the choir. He's involved in serving. Man, he's everything. Every, look, he is Mr. Ritual. He never misses. And a pastor and many of us might go, yes, but here's the problem. I'm not the standard. And you're not the standard. There's but one standard. God set a standard as good in religion as, as, as he may be, as ritualistic as he may be, there's a problem. The standard is not religion and it's not ritual. It is righteousness, perfection, holiness. You say, Pastor, nobody can get there. You're getting it. Real quickly, we have Mr. Religion and we have Mr. Ritual. But I want you to see in Philippians chapter number 3, there's a third thing Paul talks to us about. He gives a caution about religious righteousness. And then he gave a calculation. He said, look, here is who I was. He gave, a, he gave this idea, a checklist of his ritual righteousness. But then there's a third thing he talks about, and he talks about a calculation of real righteousness. Wait a minute. Religious righteousness isn't enough. Ritual righteousness is not enough. There has to be real righteousness. How do you obtain real righteousness? We've learned that's not going to cut it. Religion, as good as it may be, as helpful as it might come across, when it comes to this matter of your soul's eternal destiny, that's not enough. It's not enough to have ritual deeds and say, boy, I'll hold this up before God because as we see this morning, that makes us come short as well. What's it going to take? How do you want to be found before God one day? Do you want to hold your religion up to God and say, God, look at my religion? Do you want to hold your rituals up to God and say, God, look at my rituals? No, there better be something different. Paul talks about real righteousness. What does real righteousness look like? Look with me in verse number 7 and 8. After Paul gives this whole computation of his own ritual righteousness, look what he said in verse 7. But what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ. Look at else he said in verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Okay, now here it is real quickly. If I'm going to have real righteousness, jot this down. This is so important. There has to be, first of all, an elimination of self-righteousness. There has to be an elimination of self-righteousness. Paul said, man, I was religious. I was doing the things that I thought would get me right with God. I was doing the things that I thought would gain me entrance into heaven. And he said, when I all got to the end of it, I looked at it and I realized none of this mattered when it comes to being right with God. He said, I had to count all those things as loss. I had to eliminate my own self-righteousness. How far did he go in eliminating his self-righteousness? Well, look what he said in verse number 8 of Philippians chapter number 3. And being, uh, he said, yea, doubtless I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, 
that I may win Christ. Paul said, my religious deeds and my ritual deeds, if I was going to be made right before God, I had to literally count it all as rubbish and a pile of trash. Whoa. Pastor, that, that really hits my pride. Exactly. Because the best man can do is not even close to getting us right with God. Not even close. You can involve yourself from today on until the day you die in religious deed and ritualistic deeds. You can feed the hungry. You can feed the poor. You can clothe everyone. You can try to help the sick. And all those things are wonderful. All those things are good. But they are not enough to stand before God as right. Paul said in order to be made right with God, I had to have an elimination of my own self-righteousness. Can I tell you, all of us have some self-righteousness in us. I, I, let me tell you why. Here is how I can tell I have self-righteousness in me. Are you looking? Look right up here if you would. Here's how you and I can tell we have self-righteousness in us. When someone else sins or disappoints us, how do you respond? I told a guy last week, he said, Pastor, you disappointed me. I said, stand in line. <laughs> I disappoint myself every day. Every day. And he said, you disappoint me. You know what I wanted to say to him? You've been disappointing me for five years. I'm disappointed in myself. When I fail, I get disappointed in myself. But here's what I know. When I'm self-righteous, when someone else disappoints me and someone else fails, you know what I begin to do? Well, they should know better than that. Who did they think they are? I know some of you don't have that voice, but I'm just, you know. You see, we all have a problem. And here's our problem. We all have got a whole lot of self-righteousness. We all really do think we're a whole lot better than we really are. And we compare ourselves among each other, and we're really not wise to do that because we may say, well, I don't have a drinking problem, but you can't shut your mouth about the guy that does have one. Help us. I don't have a lying problem. Uh, excuse me. I've never told a lie. Oh, really? The truth is, we all have a lot of self-righteousness in us, and here's the problem. Our self-righteousness has a lot of holes in it. Paul said, when it came to this matter of being made right with God, I had to eliminate my resume. I had to eliminate my Jewishness and say, it's not about my deeds that I have accomplished it's not about my good works. It's not about my religion. It's not about my creed. It's not about my politics. It's not about my nationality. It's not about my race. It's not about my ethnicity. It's not about my background. I am a helpless, hopeless sinner. And he was the best. How do I get really right before God? Well, there has to be an elimination of self-righteousness, but watch this. There has to be an embracing of the Savior's righteousness. Wait a minute. How will I stand before God? I'm going to hold my religion up to God and say, this is enough. No, it's not. Well, I've done a lot of good deeds. I'll hold that up before God and say, that's enough. No, it's not enough. I have to eliminate my self-righteousness and come to a place where I am helpless before God. But then and only then can I embrace Christ's righteousness. You see, a religious man who's righteous doesn't need Christ. A ritualist 
who thinks he's righteous doesn't need Christ. He's going to hold his religion. He's going to hold his ritual up. And he's going to say, this is enough. But someone who understands that they can never believe enough and never do enough is someone who has eliminated their self-righteousness and they have turned to Jesus Christ for his righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 might be the most important verse in all the Bible, and you ought to know it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he, that's God, hath made him, that's Christ. God has made Christ to be sin for us. Did he deserve it? Wait, no. Who knew no sin? He is the sinless son of God. Jesus Christ is already over here. None of us can say that. We're on this line somewhere. That what? Why did he become sin for us? So that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We do not stand before God as righteous because of our religiosity or because of our ritual deeds. You and I can only stand as right before God if we have eliminated our self-righteousness and we have embraced the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus, on the cross, took our place. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The good news is that I deserve to be separated from God for all eternity. And because of my sin, I am separated. But Jesus Christ took my place. Watch. Oh, this is good. He took all of my sin and gave me all his righteousness. It's the great exchange. He took all of my hell that I deserve and suffered it on the cross. See, hell's a place of suffering. Jesus suffered unlike anyone else has ever suffered. Hell is a place of separation. Jesus was separated from his Father. He said, by God, by God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus took my hell for me on the cross. He switched places with me. I deserved that cross. I deserved that hell. That's who I was. But watch, a great exchange took place. Jesus took all my sin. I took all of his righteousness at the cross. Someone who has been made right with God is not someone who holds up their righteousness before God and says, look at me. I'm a good person. Look at me, I've been baptized. Look at me, I'm right with God. No, a Christian, listen carefully, a Christian is someone who says this, in my hand, no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. A Christian is someone who has stopped trying to become righteous and have started trusting Jesus Christ for their righteousness. Friend, religion is not enough. <laughs> Rituals, they're not enough. How can I know that I'm righteous? And we're going to continue down this line next week, but look real quickly in verse number 10. There's an evidence of saving righteousness. What is the evidence that I have been made right before God? Are you ready? I'm perfect now. <laughs> Come on. All right. How many of you are perfect now? Now that you've been saved, let me go ahead and see it. How many of you have never sinned since that day? Oh, come on now. There's got to be at least 100 of you. No, you understand something. I still struggle. I still fall. I still fail. Verse number 10, though, gives me an assurance that I have been made right with God. Notice what he said. Paul said, here's the evidence that I may know him and the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Here is the evidence that someone has passed from death to life. Listen carefully. Here is the evidence that someone is a child of God. Here is the evidence that we have been made right with God. Do you have a desire to know him? Do you have a desire to know him? Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever read the Bible. Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever go to church. Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I don't have time to pray. Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I'm mean as the devil. Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I don't care about other Christians. Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I have no desire to ever give to the work of God and share the gospel with other people. But I am righteous. No, you're not. Oh, you're reading my mail. Yes, I am. Because a man who's been made righteous and a woman who's been made righteous understands that as good as all those things are, they're not enough. They understand that a Savior stepped out of heaven, bled and died for their sins, took their place, and he has come into their life. He has invaded their space. He has changed them from the inside out. They do not stand in their own righteousness. They stand in his righteousness. And there is a desire. There is a passion. There is a drive to know that Jesus better. It's real. It's not just religion. It's not just ritual. No, it's real. Well, pastor, I'm one of them backslidden ones. Well, slide on back. Hear me. Listen carefully. I'm talking about real joy today. I'm talking about Jesus coming into your life and saving you today. There's a third man I want to introduce you to real quickly, and I think he's coming through. He may be asleep at this point. There he is. Come on through. There's a third category I want to introduce you to. Come on down, Brother Alex. Good to see you. I'm glad we have one spiritual man here. That's good. I'm going to have Alex stand right here this morning. Underneath this jacket, if you want to pull it back, there are two words. In him. In who? In Christ. Paul said in Philippians 3, 9, let's read it quickly. But he said in Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, not this stuff, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. How do I get made right before God? I must stop the religious and ritual shenanigans and stop trusting myself and turn from my self-righteousness and embrace Christ and Christ alone. And the Bible says at that moment, Christ comes in me and I get to come into Christ. And watch, when God sees someone like this, he doesn't see a religious man who's trying. He doesn't see a ritualistic man who's trying. He sees Christ. Why? Because we're in him. I don't want God to see John on judgment day. No, I don't want to stand before God in my own righteousness. I can never do enough. I want someone to stand in my place. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ does for a sinner he says, you step out of the way. I'm standing in your place. And when God sees a Christian, he doesn't see a do-gooder. He doesn't see a religious person. He sees Jesus because we're in him. Stop relying on yourself. Stop relying on your religiosity. It will lead you to a life of frustration and endless helpless and hopelessness. There are many of people that sit on church pews that have no joy. They sit on church pews that have no power in their life. They have no reality to their faith because they're trying and trying and trying. And I beg you today, stop trying and start trusting Jesus today because only he can make you righteous. 
See, one day, we'll all stand before God. <laughs> and Mr. Religion that stands before God, I was in Bible college. We used to have to wear a suit and a tie to school every day. Help us. 17 years old. A lot of these guys, I put myself in that category, had just learned to iron the year before. You know what we would do? We wouldn't iron our shirt and just throw a coat on. Uh, then as a real special day, we would just iron the front. <laughs> then we got married and Sarah said, that is not happening anymore. <laughs> Here was the problem though. There came some times where we had to take our coat off and it was hilarious. You look at chapel and it'd be hot in there and everybody start taking their coat and you go, oh yeah, he didn't iron his shirt. Ah! It all got exposed. See, one day the Bible says it's all going to get exposed. All of it. See, I'm going to help you out with Mr. Religion. Mr. Religion is going to have to take this coat off one day because all we can see is his religion. And we might say, that's awesome. But then on Judgment Day, he's going to have to turn around. In Matthew chapter 7, and verse 23, says it this way to those who are religious but not righteous. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, on Judgment Day, Mr. Religion may hold his religion up, but it's not going to be enough. Mr. Ritual here might have to say, you know what? I'm very devout. Look, I am so much better than everybody else. I've done more. I've given more. I've served more. But on that day, the cloak of righteousness will be removed. Mr. Ritual will have to stand before God. And when he turns around, Matthew 7, 23 will be his plight. He may even say, I cast out devils in your name. I did many wonderful works, according to verse 21 and 22, in your name. And the words, the haunting, daunting, sobering words of the universe from the God of heaven will thunder forth from his throne. Depart from me. I never knew you. Because my religion's not enough on judgment day. My rituals are not enough on judgment day. But those who are in Christ will stand before God in Him and turn around and maybe John 3 16, the greatest verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May I ask you the most important question anybody will ever ask you forever? Are you righteous? Have you been declared as right with God? I did not ask you, are you religious today? No, that's not enough. I did not ask you about your rituals. I asked you one question. Are you right with God? Are you in Jesus Christ? And child of God, if you are, joy. Joy, passion to know Him more than anything else. If you're not, I implore you this morning, I literally beg you today, get right with God. Jesus Christ has made a way, the only way, for you to be declared right with God. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together this morning.